Come on, let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are a prayer answering God, that you are a covenant keeping God. Thank you that perhaps more than in any other time in our lives, we get to see you in all of your splendor and sovereignty. That we recognize nothing we deal with on earth is greater than our God in heaven. So we thank you for being a God of all power. Thank you for loving us enough to send your son for us. Thank you for the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, would you enable us by your spirit to enable us to rightly divide your word. God, give us a word that we will live and not die. A word, God, that when I'm done listening, I'll be better than how I started listening. A word that will heal and deliver, that will save for your namesake. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to worship. Psalm 73. I'm in a series of messages from the book of Psalms. I, you know, this started to be a two-month series. It could perhaps be a three-month series. We spent the first month just in Psalm 46. And today, I want to deal out of Psalm 73. We're told in the scriptures that we ought to commit ourselves to the public reading of scripture and prayer. Um, and so I want to read all of this psalm. Psalm 73, beginning at verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the text. And we find these words recorded. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. And their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until, who would have bless you? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. <laughs> then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakens. Oh, Lord, when you roused yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I decide, desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, verse 27, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who was unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Say amen if you can. You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord. Get ready to take some notes out. I want to preach today about broken by injustice. Broken by injustice. Today, here in Psalm 73, 
I want to glean from the writings of, please grab this, the writings of King David's chosen worship leader. His name was Asaph. Scripturally, we find really three main temple worship leaders. The most significant of them is this man, his name Asaph. He was a Levite. This will be good for worship leaders and musicians to hear this. The Levites had three primary tasks. Their first primary task was to watch over the temple. The second primary task was to keep the temple holy. And their final task was, watch this, was to protect the presence of God. Asaph raises an issue that is rarely discussed in Christianity and the early church and even the church today. The question that he puts in front of us is, how is it possible that I can stand in front of the people of God and to keep the temple holy and to protect the presence of God when I'm dealing with so much stuff myself that I don't know how to handle? I wish I had people that could be honest in this moment to recognize y'all. It's dangerous to get in front of people as a leader, to get in front of people as a worshiper, to get in front of people as a teacher, to get in front of people as a musician, to get in front of people as, as some executive, as some pastor, as some person that is leading stuff. If you still are struggling with what God is up to in your life. And if we want to be honest, y'all, many of us are sitting and sitting with stuff day after day. And if I'm not careful, if I don't know how to manage and get answers to the stuff I'm dealing with, I wind up doing a disservice and a damage to the very people that God is calling me to lead and protect. Can I tell you one of the challenges of being in leadership is hard enough being in leadership because we minister in front of bleeding people. I hope y'all get this in your spirit. We lead bleeding people. And while we are leading bleeding people, I can't get my blood on them too. It's bad enough you're bleeding. And then I stand in front of you and then I bleed all over on top of you. Let me tell you something. We can only give folk what we receive. And the pressure, the issue of the text is that Asaph is saying, I am tasked with standing in front of the people of God and protecting the presence of God, but I got my own issues with God and my own issues with people, and I got to figure out a way to deal with my brokenness in order for me to protect the house of God. Every day, y'all, people give us hate. But we're supposed to preach with love. People give disloyalty. But I'm supposed to give loyalty. People give excuses. People give worldly wisdom. People give attitude. Do you know how hard it is to preach without an attitude when all week long people have been giving you theirs? Do you know how hard it is? I wish I had help in here, Ray. How hard is it to lead worship and you got to lift the weight off of other people, but you come in the building with your own weight, your own financial stuff, your own marriage stuff, your own issue, and Asaph is challenged with leading worship, but I got issues I'm dealing with. And Asaph is saying my issue is that I've been broken by injustice. I've been broken by looking and recognizing I feel like I've been given a raw deal. I've been serving God, living right, honoring him, and I'm looking around me. And all of these heathens who are not thinking about God. I'm balancing my checkbook at the end of the month. They got excess. I'm struggling, God. I'm struggling. I know I'm supposed to lead. I'm supposed to get up on Sunday. Y'all didn't miss this. Don't miss this. Psalm 73 is a song. God, I'm supposed to get up and say, truly, God is good to Israel. And you are. 
But I'm looking at the reality, and if any of us were to be honest, whether we're talking about our homes, whether we're talking about our careers, whether we're talking about our churches, whether we're talking about relationships, whether we're talking about politics, it hurts when you've been given a raw deal. Come on, is there anybody listening to this sermon that can reflect upon your own life and say, you know what? One and one doesn't always equal two and the opportunities that I thought I would have been getting or the doors that I thought would have been open. Y'all, here's Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is dealing with the raw emotion. Everybody say raw emotions. It's, it is dealing with the raw, God, I hear, feel the Holy Ghost. Because we don't want people's raw emotions. We want folk to come to church. We want them to show up at work. We want them to show up in the classroom and act like I haven't been done wrong. You, you want me to put a smile on my face we don't want to deal with the raw emotions of people. And Psalm 73 is dealing with the raw emotions. The raw emotions is that life is not always fair. That life is not always neat. That life is not always clean. And we have to recognize, y'all, that in order enough for me to move where God wants me to be, I've got to learn to deal with my emotions. Y'all, Asaph's struggle is my struggle. Asaph's struggle, if you were to be honest and not act so spiritual all the time, Asaph's struggle is your struggle. Don't you, don't, don't you dare look at me with that attitude as if you don't have those moments where you and your husband go to church but y'all struggling, but you got these heathen friends, don't neither one of them worship God, they seem happier than y'all. Don't you dare act like you don't have those moments. Well, you know, some people living this, they got a little side hustle that's not legal and you doing everything legal. You paying tax on everything you make and they skimming off the top and they driving better and living. Don't you dare act like you haven't had some moments. Come on, what does it feel like to be an instrumentalist for God? Loving my family, being faithful to my wife, honoring God, bivocational on the church but I'm working a full time job and I'm, I'm doing everything to love God and be right and then I look at these worldly musicians who snorting coke and, and smoking weed and living in million dollar houses and I'm like God what's up with this see let me tell you where emotion comes from emotion raw emotion is a result of my education and expectation not matching my experience. <laughs> and and let, me, let, me, let me say it slow so you get it. It's, it's I get emotional when I know something or expect something. And then what I get exposed to is not matching what I know. Matter of fact, I get offended with that, y'all. I might as well just go ahead and preach out of my own heart for just a moment. I get offended because that's when I feel like you, you, you making me, you, you treating me like I'm stupid. You, you treat me like I don't know better. Asaph is saying, I got to lead worship, but I got folk treating me like I'm stupid. You act like I don't know that God is good. You act like I don't know that God deals and penalizes those that don't honor him and love him. But I'm taking a step back, God, and I'm struggling with it. I'm getting emotional as I lead worship. I'm getting emotional as I preach a word. I'm getting emotional as I lead the women. I'm getting emotional as I deal with the men because, God, this is just not right. Y'all, y'all, verses 1 and 3, he says, truly God is good to Israel, to the pure in heart. And he says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. <laughs> my steps had nearly slipped. Can I park here for just a moment, y'all? Y'all going to have to give me a moment because th this sermon has a long runway. Uh, um, um, y'all, please hear this, and I'm going to minister this just for a moment. Don't let people cause you to stumble and slip. Can I just put a pin in this for a moment and give us something to shout about in our living room, something to shout about while we're driving down the street? I, I, I'm thankful to God for all those times as I look back over my life where my testimony is I almost slipped. 
I'm so thankful to God. Maybe I'm the only one, but I believe most people that I'm preaching to right now will look back over your life and say, I could go year after year over all the times I almost slipped. But thanks be to God, it was God that was keeping me. It was God that was protecting me. It was God that was hovering over me. And can we take a moment, wherever we may be right now, and give God glory and give God honor for the time I almost slipped. You almost made me cuss you. You almost made me cut you. You almost made me walk out. You almost made me not do right. But I thank God for all the times I almost slipped. Don't let folk cause you to slip. Don't let folk take you out of your character. Don't let folk take you out of who you are in Jesus. But can I give you something else to shout about? I don't just thank God for all the times Eric I almost slipped. I'm going to run around this sanctuary today when I think about all the times I did slip. But the Lord broke my fall. I don't know, maybe I'm all by myself, but I'm thankful to God for those moments I slipped, but the Lord caught me. I messed up, but the Lord forgave me. I didn't do right, but the Lord gave. Can we take a moment and give God glory for all the time somebody shout, he broke my fall. Aren't you the one that got pregnant as a teenager? Yup, but he broke my fall. Weren't you the one that lost your job because you didn't do right? Yup, I broke my fall. I want to thank God for breaking my fall. That's why you need a relationship with Jesus. Because all of us are going to almost slip, and then some of us will slip. And when we slip, we serve a God that breaks falls. Oh, God. God, thank you. I'm almost ready for breaking my fall. The reason I passed the word Tabernacle Church is not because we were looking for a church planner that did not fall, slip. We were looking for one that be honest about slipping and then would give God glory for telling the story that God broke my fall. And can I help y'all go get a shout in in this room and then shout in wherever you may be. You should thank God for the folk that pushed you down. See, some of y'all not being honest. See, sometimes I'm slipping because of me. But sometimes I'm slipping because you're trying to push me down. But the joke is on you. Every time you push, I serve a God that catches. Every time I say it to you, get in your spirit. Every time you push, somebody shout it out. You push, God catches. Come on, get it in your spirit. You push, God catches. And so let me tell my enemy, the joke is on you. Because God was able to keep me from falling. Asaph said, I'm struggling with this injustice I'm looking at. But I thank God that I almost slipped and I didn't. But then I thank God for the times I did slip. And he broke my fall. In a very real way, y'all, this is where we are in America right now. We are at a moment. As I preach this sermon, we are at a moment where millions of people are grappling with what the proper response is to being broken by injustice. We live in a nation that was founded on principles of equality, principles of protection, principles of the fundamental right of the rule of law. And yet every data set proves that African Americans are treated differently. We're treated differently in regard to stop and search we are treated differently in regard to arrest. We are treated differently in regard to conviction. We are treated differently in regard to sentencing. Y'all not being honest in here. And yet, I'm supposed to preach like nothing happened. Yet, Ray's supposed to sing. Danielle's supposed to sing. Simon's supposed to sing. Y'all supposed to play like nothing happened. What is the right biblical response to being broken by injustice. Asaph, watch this, is dealing with social inequality. Asaph is dealing with social inequality. Social inequality is the condition of unequal access to the benefits of belonging to any society. What he's saying is that 
if we all belong to the same society, shouldn't we all have equal benefits to belonging? We're grappling with this as a church. We're calling it standard of care. And the reason we're developing a system of standard of care is because we in the church don't want to create a system of social inequality. Can I, can I tell you why there was a hymn sung this morning? Because every time we sing just praise and worship music, just contemporary music, and no hymns, anthems, or spirituals, we are developing a system of worship inequality. We are saying we are the ones with the mic. Preach Pastor Gale. We're the ones with the song selection. And it doesn't matter to me, Mr. 80-year-old. It doesn't matter to me, Mr. 75. It doesn't matter that we've come this far by faith. And we have to be careful in the church that we have a system of social equality. A system, whether you are male or female, whether you are 13 or whether you are 93, that you don't walk up into an environment that is supposed to embrace everyone equally and then have our, our, our cliques, our favorites. In a purely equal society, every citizen, every member is able to contribute to the overall well-being of that society. They are equally able to bend. Watch this. We should be equally able to benefit from our membership. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. We should be able to equally benefit from our membership. Y'all, and one of the problems with being black in America, and this is also the problem with being poor in America, whether you're black, white, or brown, is that not only are we sinners, but we are also the most sinned against. This is why the gospel we preach is a gospel, first of all, of justification by faith in Jesus. Because the justification by faith in Jesus is a gospel that deals with my individual sin. Stay close. But it is also a gospel of social justice. And when we preach this gospel of social justice alongside of justification by faith, I'm not just addressing my individual sin, but now by social justice, I'm addressing institutional sins against individuals. Y'all, and this is not just a race. Y'all going to have to let me part for a moment. This is not just a race conversation. This is a poverty conversation. Money bail. Let me tell you what that means. It means I need money to stay out of jail. Y'all not hearing me. Something is fundamentally wrong when two people can commit the same crime in the same community at the same time and one is in jail because they can't afford bail. Poverty should never be criminalized. Y'all not hearing me. Asaph is like, I'm looking at social inequality. What I know about you, God, can I, be, can I share it like it's in my heart? I know it's out there. I know some, I might get in trouble with some folks. I struggle with a black Christian in jail for being broke and a white heathen do the same thing and out golfing. I don't have help in the house of God, but that's all right. Suspended driver's license. What does having a driver's license do with money? But most people in our state that have a suspended license, it is not because of their driving record. It is because they can't afford court fees. I'm not scared today. I'm out here. Y'all might as well just hunker in for a moment. Watch this. The, most single, the single most important factor of having a job is getting there. Y'all not hearing me. Which means the single most important factor to having a job and keeping a job is having a driver's license. 
How can I have a driver's license? Which means how can I have a job if you charge me money to have it? Excessive mandatory minimums. Unjust. African Americans make up 12% of the United States population. But we make up 38% of the prison population. Twelve percent of the U.S. population, and near forty percent of the coronavirus deaths in Wisconsin. Black folk make up six percent of the population, and twenty-seven percent of the coronavirus deaths. African Americans are twenty-two percent of the North Carolina population but we are making up 40% in our state of coronavirus deaths. Y'all, can I go deeper for a moment? African Americans are 22% of the North Carolina population, and we're 52% of the prison population. CEO pay. 1965, CEOs made 24 times more than the average worker. You need to hear me. You wondering why ASAP struggling? 1965, CEOs made up 20. Made their 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 uh, salaries were 24 percent more than the average worker. You need to hear me. That was 1965, 24 times more. Now their pay is 195 times more. person that owns, I ain't scared, I'm out here now, the person that owns the Hardee's, the McDonald's, the person that owns the fast food chain that makes millions of dollars a year can afford to increase a wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour. But it's not just poverty and race. It's gender. Do y'all know what the equal pay day is? The equal pay day was on March 31st of this year for all women. What that means is find a man with your degree, with your education, with your experience, with your exact same skill set. Y'all both started working January 1st of last year. On December 31st, he stopped working. You had to work all of January, all of February, and all of March of this year just to catch up to where he was last year. But it's worse for black women. Y'all still working. For black women, your equal pay day this year won't be until August 13th. That means you find a male counterpart that does what you do they got done working on December 31st of 2019. They have not been back to work. And you're going to have to work all this year until August 13th to catch up with what he made. Okay, if you're talking about education, health care, criminal justice reform, policing reform, banking and economics, board appointments, the protesting we are seeing should not be viewed I need someone to hear this. I need my white friends to hear me. This protesting should not be viewed as a fix to police brutality. It should be viewed as a fix to systemic injustice. Because when we fix systemic injustice, then we will also fix the fact that 94% of all black men died not from the police, but at the hands of another black man. So when I've been broken as the worship leader, you, I'm, I'm going to say it. You, you enjoy his or her singing, but you need to accept the fact that they black. Y'all missed it. You miss it. Can y'all, can y'all, can y'all, I'm a black pastor. That means... You want me to be spiritual, 
But you have to accept the fact that there is a brokenness that I live through. That in order to be effective for Jesus, I need to deal with my brokenness. Psalm 73, thank you, Jesus, helps me deal with my brokenness by injustice. Y'all ready? I spent 25, 30 minutes just giving you the problem. I'm, 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 yes, I'm preaching the whole sermon. I'm going to give you the seven things, the seven things Asaph teaches us about how he dealt with his brokenness from injustice. Whew. First thing Asaph teaches us is that the first thing I need to do is reach out. Somebody say reach out. And it's in verse 15. Verse number 15, Asaph is basically saying, I wanted to express how I was feeling about the prosperity of the wicked but I was afraid I would lead some of your children astray. Let me park here for a moment. One of the biggest mistakes we can do is to act like we're not hurting. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is to just not get it out. At some point, I got to find a way. Because let me tell you the people that scare me. The people that scare me are the ones that act like don't nothing ever phase them. Nothing ever bothers them. Because at some point, you're going to boil over and it's going to be like, uh, it, you're just going to pop your lid. And at some point, I have to have the ability to reach out. Stop acting like I'm not hurting. He says here in verse 15, I wanted to get it out. But watch this. But I got to be careful who I get it out with. I might as well just go for it. Sometimes, see, let me, let me just say this in love. Let me just say this in love. Um, you can't talk to everybody about what you're feeling. And, and we got to recognize, we got to own the fact that, that I need to reach out. I need to find a place. Everybody say an ally, an ally. We need an ally. We need somebody that's going to support us, somebody that's going to encourage us. And can I tell you how you know when somebody is not an ally? You know they are not an ally when they want to talk more than you do. Can, can I just say this in love? Let me just say this in love. Y'all, everybody who's been in the majority, everybody who's been the one kind of out in front leading stuff into this mess. You had the microphone long enough. So here it is, finally I get the mic and you want to wrestle. You had the mic for 450 years. Yeah, I'm sorry, let me. We have to resist expressing doubt to weak people. We have to resist just holding it in. We've got to find a safe place to reach out. Put, put this in your notes. Don't act like I'm not broken. If I'm upset, if I'm struggling, I've got to be honest about that thing. I've got to own that thing. We, 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 need select, we need to be selective about who we talk to. We need an ally that, that is willing to get alongside of us. So I need to reach out if I'm going to get on the other side of this. But here's the second thing. I don't just need to reach out. I need to refer to God. I believe the turning point is in verse 17. Let me talk to my, what is it called? What's, is it Generation X that comes after millennials? Y, Z? Okay. Let me just talk to Generation Z. If you look at this worship leader struggling with the brokenness of injustice, by his own admission, it did not start getting better until he went to church. See, we have Generation Z. Let me help y'all for a moment. The key action here is going to the sanctuary. Asaph, let me tell you why. Because Asaph puts himself in God's presence. Y'all, please write, write this down. I can't sort out spiritual problems with natural thinking. <sighs> let me say it one more time. I can't sort out spiritual problems with natural thinking. At the heart and fabric of America is a spiritual problem. 
I'm going to say it again. At the heart of the problem of America is a spiritual problem. Because if you really know God and you really know Jesus and you really have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't let you do people wrong. See, watch this. When I refer to God, when I get close to God, I get God's presence. Y'all, we, we get so far from God that we don't see the world like God sees the world. But what Asaph is doing is Asaph had been evaluating life on outward accoutrements. He had been evaluating life based upon success and prosperity. And he says, let me take a step back. And we have this tendency to remove ourselves from where we can find the answer. And I know I'm a preacher, but the answer is still with God. The answer is still with Jesus. And when we get into the sanctuary and the house of God, I get God's presence. But there's a third thing he teaches us. He teaches us that I need to review the big picture. When Asaph goes into God's presence... He takes a look, everybody say, their complete lives. And I want you to get this. We don't get away with anything. And I know it may look good down here, but the time is going to come when we're going to all, we were talking about this before worship started. Y'all, the time is going to come when I'm going to have to stand before Jesus. And when I stand before Jesus, there's going to be a bunch of folk that were deacons and elders and apostles and a bunch of folk that were state representatives and legislators and a bunch of folk that were presidents and a bunch of folk that were vice presidents and a bunch of folk that were senators and congressmen that the time is going to come and the Lord is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And at the end of the day, can I encourage somebody? I'd rather live 80 years on earth in poverty and live eternity in a house of gold where every day is Sunday than to spend 80 years in luxury and spend eternity in poverty. Oh, God. You got to look at the complete lives. He discovered, Asaph discovered, that without God, man can't really have inner strength. That without God, everything that I have is really just a mirage. Everybody say it's a mirage. I want you, I don't care how nice that beamer is. You ain't taking it with you. Be clear about that. You might be driving better than me now. You might be living better than me now. And if, it, if I were you, I would be scared to spend life on earth doing the people of God wrong, knowing that one day I'm going to stand before my maker and everything around me was just a mark. I don't care how nice your house is here. It is a shack compared to how you'll live with Jesus. It was a, it's all a mirage. It, please, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know who I'm going to have left. It's a mirage to think you can do people wrong and it don't come back on you. I'm not done yet. This is an equal opportunity sermon. And it's a mirage to think you cannot participate in a system and it's going to do you right. Those 8,000 black folk in Rocky Mount that didn't vote, shh, no protesting for you. You can't ignore a system and think it will benefit you. So all this no voting, all of this. Th Maybe I'm looking at the wrong media outlets. I've yet to see a sign at a protest saying vote. I've yet to see a voter registration table. Now at the end of the day, you can march all you want. You can tear down all the monuments you want. But until different men and women that honestly love God care about all people until they're in a position to legislate for everybody, you're wasting your time. Where am I at? Number four. The fourth thing this text teaches us is I need to respond to being wrong. Put your hands on yourself and say, even I'm wrong sometimes. I want you to get that in your spirit. Even I'm wrong sometimes. I love this because verses 21 and 22, the psalmist does what we ought do, and that is he evaluates himself. 
He says, man, my heart was grieved. I was vexed in my mind. I was foolish. I was ignorant. I was like a beast before you. He was like, man, I got this thing all wrong. He says, man, man, I got to get myself together. I need to correct myself. It is our relationship. Please get this. It is our relationship with God that enables us to admit when we haven't, when we haven't thought through something correctly. Y'all thought it was bad before. Let me say it one more time. It's only my relationship with God that helps me understand when I have not thought through something correctly. You want an example? Yeah, you do. The Confederate flag. Stop shortening the name. It is not Confederate. It is the Confederate States of America. Y'all didn't hear me. The vice president of the Confederate States of America was a man named Alexander Hamilton Stevens. Two weeks before the start of the Civil War, the vice president of the Confederate States of America made a speech. The speech was called the Cornerstone Speech. Let me quote him. This is what he says. Our new government... That means not the United States of America, the Confederate States of America. Our new government, its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests. That's why I was called the cornerstone speech. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. Its cornerstone rests. That slavery, subordination to a superior race is the natural and normal condition for black people. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Two weeks later, they go to war. 600,000 people died over a failed rebellion. The Confederate flag is not about patriotism. It is about treason. It is a symbol of disunity and slavery. And at the end of the day, it has no place in the United States of America. And if you're a Christian, you need to, if you're a white Christian, you need to own the fact that you thought through this wrong. Basic ASAP for saying, I feel stupid. There's a lot I should have known. I got to admit when I'm wrong. There's power in admitting when you are wrong. Can I tell you why we can't admit when we're wrong? Because it takes humility. To so that couple that's trying to get right in your marriage, humble yourself and admit when you're wrong. Things didn't go like you thought it was going to go with your kids. Admit that you didn't always get it right. Humble yourself and admit that you're wrong. When you got your mind made up that the church is not the answer, humble yourself and admit that the church is an answer. That's why Proverbs 16 says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let me tell you what will happen, y'all. This might be worth writing down. My pride will fight to the death to avoid embarrassment. But when I admit that I'm wrong, there's a relief. <laughs> when I remit and admit that I'm wrong, there's a redemption. When I admit that I'm wrong, there's a recovery. Just admit when you are wrong. I'm, I'm out of time, y'all. I'm out of time. Let me give you these quick. I don't have time to preach them. Number, number, where? number five, remember God's love and goodness. In verse 23, Asaph says to God, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. He realizes that while he was questioning God, God was never questioning him. He remembers that in the midst of everything he's going through, what I, what's going to get me through is God's love and goodness. And can I remind all of us, despite all that we've been through, we still serve a God that is loving and a God that is good and a God that is kind. And in the midst of all of that, you won't make me doubt him. I'm going to hold on to his goodness. But then I've got to rebuild with faith in God. Verses 25 and 26, Asaph reestablishes his faith in God. Who am I having heaven but you? 
and there's none on earth that I desire beside you. Biblically responding to brokenness of injustice. Oh, God, this is going to be so hard. I got to rebuild. Y'all didn't hear it. I need to rebuild with faith in God. Pastor, why do I need to rebuild that way? Because there's going to be some long-standing relationships that you're about to lose. And so I can't rebuild thinking you're going to be around. I need to rebuild based on my faith in God. Here's the last thing. I jot, let me just jot this down before I get to the last point. The world is into price tags, but God is into genuine value. Rebuild not based on this stuff and people, but rebuild based on faith in God with genuine value. And then here's the last thing, point seven. Resolve to stay close to God. Psalm's seventh step is a resolve to stay near God, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in him. Everybody say, get back in sync with God. I want you to see when we get back in sync with God. Y'all, I, y'all know my heart. But I got to say it because I need to sleep good at night. If Christians don't get this season right, our nation is doomed. The largest Protestant Christian denomination in America is the Southern Baptist Church. That denomination was formed over the issue of slavery. And now, hundreds of years later, you are still being silent. This is not a season to be silent. I'm not scared. First Baptist Church, you can't be quiet. Inglewood Baptist, you can't be quiet. Every South Calvary Baptist, you can't be quiet. My Evangelical Assemblies of God Church on the Rock, you can't be quiet. Redeemer Church, you can't be quiet. There are people that you do ministry with in this city that have been broken by injustice. And you need to be an ally to help fix this in our community.